This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. Welcome to the show. I'm very excited about this episode because it's a trial run for the upcoming season. As you know, I like to change things up every season, and so I hope you love this new format. On today's show, I chat with a Viscountess and then chat with Heather R. Darcy about Anne of Cleves, and she answers all of your burning questions in our new segment called Ask the Expert. And lastly, I'll tell you all about one female tutor killer. You're going to love this story. It's unbelievable. But before we get started, I'd like to thank my newest patrons, Chris O, Alyssa C, Carolyn I, Danielle T, Simone H, and Julie M. Thank you so much for your support. And thanks as well to all of you who are existing patrons. Now, if you'd like to become a patron, you can do so by going to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty and click become a patron. Right now, patrons receive early access to lessons on my tutor course, as well as being eligible to win my monthly patron gift giveaways. This month, I am giving away two eBooks to all of my patrons. Yeah, you heard me right. Every single patron on Patreon is going to get two eBooks. The first one is Mary Tudor Princess by Tony Riches. That one is about Henry VIII's sister, Mary. And the second one is called Frailty of Human Affairs by Carolyn Angus. That is a book about Thomas Cromwell. You are going to love both of these. In addition to both of those, one lucky patron is going to win a copy of Nicola Tallis's Uncrowned Queen about Margaret Beaufort. This just came out on July 28th, and I'm so excited to have a copy for one lucky patron. So make sure to sign up as a patron so that you get access to these books. Now, if you enjoy the Tudor's Dynasty podcast, please subscribe or follow wherever you listen to my episodes. Also, if you feel so inclined to do so, please leave a review there as well. Absolutely love it when I get reviews and love to hear from you guys. If you'd like to reach out to chat on one of the subjects of my show or even just to say hi, you can do so on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or you can now email me at Rebecca at TudorsDynasty.com. And lastly, I'm now offering personalized video messages to anyone who would be interested in receiving one or maybe giving one to a friend or a loved one. Want to learn more? Just go to my website and click in the menu on Personalized Messages. What would Tudor history be without its magnificent historic homes? My guest on the show today is Julie Montague, Viscountess Hinchingbrook, host of An American Aristocrat's Guide to Great Estates and caretaker of the Mapperton Estate in Dorset. Now, in similar fashion to after the World Wars, these great estates or even just manor homes, are once again at risk. Loss of revenue during the COVID-19 pandemic have left many of these estates looking for new ways to raise funds for repairs. Now, to put this in perspective, from the year 1900, just over 1,000 country houses were demolished in England alone. Now, while I, I really don't think anyone is considering taking a sledgehammer to any of these historic homes, I do find it important to do what we can to help keep history alive. And that is one of the reasons why I wanted Julie on the show today. So let's get to it. Julie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And and we we connected through digitally and we're still digitally connected, aren't we? <laughs> we are. Um, technology is amazing. I know it really is. It is. So um, thank you for reaching out to me. And, um, and then, I've, of course, I've researched everything that you're doing. And as I said before we even started this, I was like, you know so much more than I do, which is um, so I'm so happy to be connected because I think I can learn um, a lot from you as well. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> well, I originally learned about you from An American Aristocrat's Guide to Great Estates. And then somehow after that, I stumbled upon the three seasons of Ladies of London and felt like I really got to discover the real Julie by watching both of those. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, d- there's I would say I'm def- it, the, the real Julie definitely more, uh, presides more in American Aristocrats um, than it does in, in a reality TV show, even though it's meant to be reality. 
as I think we all know, reality can be manipulated. <laughs> so, but yes, yeah, yeah. You, you got, you got, you got both of me there. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed being able to see the two sides of you, but of course I enjoy the great estates even more because of my passion um, for, especially the Tudor history. So for those who haven't watched the program, Julie, can you please explain maybe your background a bit and how you became to be an American aristocrat? Yeah, sure. So, um, so obviously the TV series is quite long, uh, an American aristocrat's guide to great estates, which just recently finished airing on Smithsonian channel. But you know, you, I'm, of course I'm going to plug it again, but you can get it on Amazon prime and iTunes and Hulu and all that. But it's a little bit about me is obviously I'm American and I came over here about 20 years ago, uh, for my job and then met my husband who at the time of dating him for at least the good first sort of three months, I didn't really know his illustrious past. I mean, I just thought he was wonderful Luke Montague. And it wasn't until further into the relationship that I learned that his ancestor uh, was the one who brought Charles II back from exile. Um, so obviously a little bit later than the Tudor period, but, but ba- brought Charles II back from exile to then uh, restore the monarchy. So brought him back for the restoration when King Charles II uh, became king again. And then therefore he gave uh, Edward Montague, who was a great naval officer, a peerage, and, and that became the Earl of Sandwich. And the reason it's Sandwich, I always try to tell people, is is it's it's because they're like, where what sandwich? Like the sandwich we eat? I'm like, yes, the, it was named after uh, his ancestor, the Sandwich was, but it was a great naval port. So it was a big naval port over here in England. And that's so he when he chose the title, he wanted it to be an esteemed title uh, and and did it after the after one of the ports that his ship sailed in and out of, which was Sandwich, which is in Kent over here. So sandwich, obviously, like you said, we associate that with the snack food. But how can you explain? And I think you told the story um, on the show as well, how that name came about, how the whole sandwich thing came about. Yeah. So it's and funny enough, it wasn't the first Earl. So you have Edward Montague, who was knighted, if you like, or made given the peerage. Uh, by King Edward II, and that's when the sandwich title uh, took hold. And then the fourth earl, so a few earls on, the fourth earl, again, was another great naval officer. And he, uh, the, this, the, the rumor, and the, we, we tried to debunk this myth, was that he was gambling, and he didn't want to get his cards dirty, so he asked his, his butler to put his piece of roast beef in between two slices of bread. However, however, the, the real story is that he was a big uh, politician and very, very busy. I mean, he, had, he was so, so busy and, and obviously head of the admiralty over here that he was working at his desk so much that he wasn't getting up to eat, kind of sounds familiar, what we do today in the 21st century, that he then asked that his piece of roast beef be put in between two slices of bread. And they then called it uh, the sandwich. And that is, it is, this, the famous snack is named after my husband's ancestor. I love that story so much. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, it's too bad we didn't, he didn't trademark it back then. I don't think he'd, you know, I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> you wouldn't need any help with Mapperton. <laughs> I know, I know. I was like, oh my gosh, if only, if only he knew what chaos he has put us all into. No, I'm just kidding. But yeah, but yeah, that is how the story goes. Wow. And so the Earl and Countess of Sandwich are your in-laws. Yeah. And yes. in the last few years, correct me if I'm wrong, they have handed over, so to speak, Mapperton to you and your husband to run? Yeah. So they handed it over the running of it. So obviously they're they're still the Earl and Countess until until um further notice. And um and so they hand it over, and that's quite a that's quite a common thing to do. Is you want to be able to hand over to the next generation when you know the, when we're still uh, quite have have quite a lot of energy in us. So they hand it over about three years ago. I think it was about about three years ago, and we've been really running the management side of it um, ever since. And it and it's just it, it's an incredible amount 
of work, as you know, because you're a, a tutor expert, but um, part of the house is was built in the 1540s, so in the Tudor period, and um, and you know, and the repairs and the leaks. And the restoration uh, just on that part of the house is quite extensive. And then, of course, the, a diff different bit was then built in the 17th century. And then another bit was built in the 18th century. So you have three different centuries all, uh, you know, working together at this house, which but causes obviously a lot of um, uh, a lot of grief sometimes because it's not like you can go to Home Depot and and uh, get the tools <laughs> to repair. Do you know what I mean? It takes a, a leak. A leak, for example, you know, takes months to repair. So it, here, it, it's a like, here I am complaining about my house, which was built in 1950, having issues. <laughs> No, I yeah. know. I there's sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh. Like anytime you see a leak, which is quite often, because you know the house is obviously so old that we and in you and because it's listed, so over in this country you have a thing called after this well, really after the Second World War, over a thousand, I think it's even, no, I think it's even more than that, but I'll say, I think it's about a thousand homes were either, historic homes were either left in ruin or set on fire or damaged because the homeowners couldn't keep them up anymore. And there wasn't, there weren't any laws protecting these historic homes. So this country lost over a thousand beautiful homes, many, many of them Tudor homes. And so that's when the country put into place this listing system. So if it's a grade one listed building, which Mapperton is, it, be, it literally means it's of extraordinary value. That's what they call it. And that, they don't mean value by currency. They mean value as in historical value. So it's of extraordinary historical value. So you can't you can't put up a wall to, in the middle of the house and you can't knock down a wall and you can't just oh, that lead window that's 200 years old, let's just get rid of it and put in one from Home Depot. You have to make sure that all the repairs try as much as they can to stick to their own original features. And that's where the expense comes in. Wow. I... <laughs> I can't, I can't even imagine. I'm just, <laughs> I'm yeah. speechless. I can't even imagine. So this is why it's so important that you're able to raise the funds that are needed to maintain Maverton House. So yeah. important. It's so, honestly, Rebecca, it's so important. And I think, I think sometimes, and, and I was quite naive like this, and I thought, well, do you know what? It's of historical value. Surely it's like, you know, the aristocrats are like the royal family and, you know, they get taxpayer money. That's absolutely, I mean, not even close to being true. It's only the royal family that gets taxpayer money. Not the aristocrats and the one and that you saw even through the TV series, it's all funded through visitor income. And visitor income can include opening up your house to the public, to the gardens, to the cafe, if you have a cafe, to the shops, and of course, to weddings and events. And so those are the things that help with all, with literally all of the repair and the restoration. But because of COVID-19 and like every other business across the world, we've lost all of our visitor income and it's had a massive effect on, of course, on, and we had over lockdown, we had, I think we had six leaks. I mean, <laughs> so oh it was my. like, no. Yeah. We just, we've just gotten around to repairing one of them. So we just did get around to repairing one of them. Wow. Well, that's good. And I, I want to talk more about how people can help a little bit later because I really, I really want to go oh, back to, to the Tudor part of the yeah. home. Um, like you said, um, it was built in the 1540s by Robert Morgan. Is there yeah. anything that you can tell us about him? Because I wasn't able to find very much about Robert Morgan. No, do you know what? I think as it was just, it, it was a, he had made some money. Um, and of course, back then when you made money, you, you know, it's all about status and power. So you build, you know, during that period and, and beyond, you know, even in the Elizabethan, uh, period, you know, right after the Tudor period, you, you would build these, if you had money, you would build these homes in the hopes that the king or the queen 
would even pass by or stay there. So I, I don't think he was necessarily building a home so that the monarchy would, would come and stay there, but you would build the home and put your crests and your gargoyles um, all around it. And it was, it was in a sense, staking in your, your status. So there's not too much about him apart from the fact that he had money and he built this home and the design is beautiful. But of, but of course, then, then later on during the, the Georgian period, and that's what it's quite interesting. When you look at Mapperton, you can see it does kind of all fit together apart from the west facing side of the house where you and that's the Tudor side where two generations later, um, he, the, they put up a Georgian facade over the outside of the Tudor part because Georgian at that period, the Georgian uh, architecture was very, very popular. And again, it showed off your status. So in the, in the Tudor part of the house, it's, it's amazing because you can open up these paneled walls and you can see the original Tudor doors. And then when you go to the outside, to the exterior part of the house, it's a Georgian front um, fronted house because that was the popular time. And it wasn't wasn't cool to have a Tudor you know, exterior anymore. So this wall was put up and, and to, to make it look Georgian. But what, what, it, what it all makes it very fascinating now because you can really go around the house and think, oh, my gosh, that's Tudor or that's Georgian or that's Jacobean. Um, because everybody was trying at Mapperton in particular to put their mark on it and to make, you know, their status and their power much more seen. So the, the Tudor part of the house, I am really curious, architecturally speaking, when you walk into the Tudor part of the manor house and then you walk into the 17th century edition, how does it differ it differs quite, it's, you can tell, uh, in particular, the ceiling. So in the great chamber, um, which, is, which is now a bedroom, but the great chamber used to be the area where the Lord would go into and, and sort of retreat, not to sleep, but retreat. It was, it was sort of like a, his, his living space, if you like. The great chamber in the house, which again is just above the drawing room, and it's the Tudor part of the house, has this most extraordinary uh, uh, sort of pendulum ceiling and the exact same ceiling, a, a replica in a set, well, not replica, but the s same ceiling is in a room at Hampton Court Palace um, in obviously their Tudor part of, of the palace. And so you can really tell a difference if you look hard. At, well, it's not even, you don't even have to look that hard. Is It's the ceilings. So you've got the fleur de -lis ceiling down in the drawing room. Then right up above it, you've got the pendulum uh, ceiling, which is extraordinary both both Tudor and then you walk into you know a different part of the house and for example um, you've got the one of the ceilings in the different part of the house has the arts and crafts so um, you can't necessarily tell really so much of the uh, 18th century ceilings because then somebody else came in during the arts and crafts period and decided to lower the ceiling and put up a new ceiling. Do you see, so there's so many different facets throughout the house where, where the, the owners were trying to put in you know, to make their mark. But you can definitely, for me, the biggest, uh, I guess, uh, giveaway is looking at the ceilings of the different rooms, and that's how you can tell which is a different period. How many bedrooms does Mapperton have? Do you know? Yeah, do you know what? We get asked that quite a bit, and it just depends on what you would consider a bedroom. <laughs> but I mean, I think overall it's 15, so it's 15. And, and how many bathrooms? Well, that's interesting. So originally, of course, there was only, well, originally there was just a bath outside in, which we still have, um, which is the Tudor bath outside in the garden. So, and it wasn't even, it was at that period, it was just in the back of the house before we made it into the Italian at gardens they are today. So you have this, you know, you had to walk, go down these stairs. It looks like a dungeon. We still have it. It's, it's locked up, but, um, so the public can't see it cause it's of historical value, but that's where they used to bathe. And then of course, when, when baths and chamber pots could obviously uh, some type of plumbing, if you like, came into the house, it would have one loo, uh, which is one toilet and one bath. And that, that was it for 
quite some time. Then I think when my in-laws came in, they added a couple more, as many as they could. And then when Luke and I took it over three years ago, I'm going to tell you how many we added, hold on, quite a few. We've added, hold on, one, two, three, four, five, six. I think we've added six en suite bathrooms. <laughs> so, wow. so, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So uh, presumably that's for when you have guests come stay, I would assume. Yeah. So we don't re- we, we pretty much live in, and you probably saw this from the TV series as well. We, we live in a very, very small part of the house that literally has, uh, you know, five bedrooms. I know it doesn't sound, but four bedrooms cause we have four children and then one bedroom for my husband and I, and then a sitting room and a kitchen. And that's, pretty much where we live. Then of course we do open up the house, um, for paying guests. And, but that's only during my yoga retreats. So I do two to three yoga retreats a year. And when we decided to bring that in as an additional source of, of income for the, for the house is we knew that we had to obviously have to create these ensuite bathrooms. But again, it's not like going to Ikea or to Home Depot and just, you know, taking a week or so to fix up an ensuite bathroom. Each of these ensuite bathrooms that we put in took months. And because you ha- you're, you're dealing with the stone from the outside, you know, which is hundreds of years old. You're dealing with, with piping. You're dealing with having to cut through and up into, you know, re- very, very ancient floorboards. And it's, it, you have to get in so many different experts, historical experts, to make sure that once we get the planning permission, um, that we were doing it the right way. How intense. Yeah. It's not, whatever you do there, nothing is simple. No. Oh my gosh, Rebecca. No, it's uh, like, I, I've just escaped funny enough. I'm, I'm sitting here doing this interview with right now. I've escaped up to London just because I've been down obviously through the lockdown and, and beyond at Mapperton and it's, 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 yes, it's beautiful and it's lovely. And we know that we are so unbelievably fortunate, but also that home is our business. So it's very, very hard to relax if I'm perfectly honest there, because I've now grown accustomed to when I walk through the house, instead of thinking, and, and I probably should turn my tune on this, but it's very difficult. Instead of thinking, wow, this is extraordinary. I look around and I think, okay, so that frame, that frame's got live worm in it. We're going to have to repair that 17th century frame. Oh my gosh, look at the cracks that are happening in the ceiling right there. We're gonna, that's got to go on the list. Oh dear. I think that there's going to be another leak right there. That is something's wrong. Like you, you walk through the rooms now and you, because you're the caretakers of these homes, you have to take care of them. So you walk through the rooms and you just think, right, that needs to go on the list. We've got to repair that. Like today I was sent pictures. We just repaired some of the staircase, the back staircase. And, and, and I was sent a picture of it. You know what I mean? Since afterwards, I knew it was happening, but I was sent a picture of it. So it's constantly making sure that these homes survive not just for future generations, but so that they survive so that the public can learn about the history of England and the architecture. And in particular, as you know, Rebecca, the importance of the Tudor period. And um, and and hopefully, even by looking at architecture like Matt Britton, and in particular, the Tudor period of the house, which to me is the most beautiful part of the house, is then hopefully it will spark interest in others to then learn more about the Tudor time and um, hopefully have an interest in, in history. I think one of the things that even the Tudor fanatics are intrigued with is paintings. And Maberton House has Oh my gosh, just from the little bits that I've seen on TV, it looks like hundreds of paintings. Do you have any idea how many are in the house? (laughs) Well, do you know, we loan some to museums and 
we, my in-laws have some in, in their house. And so with their kind of, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, hundreds, I can tell you that. Um, do you know, I'm not, I'm not sure, but it, it reminds me, we do have this, we have the founding father of the Montague family and it was painted during the Tudor period and he had his big white collar on and, and, um, and I don't know if you know, you probably know this, but during the Tudor period, it cost extra money to have your hands painted because apparently they were very difficult to paint. So to have your real hands painted, it cost extra money. So the founding father of sort of the whole Montague dynasty, we have his portrait and the same portrait is, is in one of the TV series at, at, when I go to visit another Montague house called Boughton house. And they have the exact same one. It's, it's Edward, um, uh, Mont well, the first Lord of, um, first Lord Montague, Edward Montague. And he, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't afford to have his hands painted properly. So they look, they, they look creepy. They look like weird, <laughs> creepy hands. So we have a plant in front of his hands <laughs> because they're quite creepy. But yeah, during that, yeah, it cost money, more money back then to have your hands painted properly. I didn't know that, but now I'm picturing his hands like if I had painted them. <laughs> yeah, they're creepy. Do you know what I mean? And so we just cover it up with a plant. They're awful. Oh, wow. Do you have any idea who painted that one? Oh, I do. Rebecca, I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. I can't yeah. remember okay. his name. But yeah, yeah, but we share the painting with um, uh, the Duke of Buclu, who is uh, uh, comes from the the original Montague family as well. And it's in, in one of the episodes oh, I yeah. visit Bouts and House. So, yeah. That was fascinating too. So, well, now we know that there are hundreds of paintings in the house and you probably don't know them all because there are so many, but are there any other interesting items in Mapperton that people might be surprised to learn that you have other than paintings? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I think especially the American audience um, for me, what's fascinating is that the fourth Earl of Sandwich, not only did he obviously name the sandwich that we know today, the snack as the sandwich, but more importantly, as we, as I said earlier, he was this great naval officer and he sponsored Captain Cook and many of his voyages for discovery. And that obviously that was a very popular thing to do during that period. And, and Captain Cook actually discovered um, on the fourth Earl's dime, the Sandwich Island. Well, he named them the Sandwich Islands and it's now present day Hawaii. So it was the, the islands before that they were called Hawaii. Captain Cook had named them the Sandwich Islands named after his sponsor, the fourth Earl of Sandwich. So I always found that was really interesting that, you know, I, I have this connection with the family that I married into because present day Hawaii used to be called the Sandwich Islands. Um, I want to move in. Can is do you have a room for me? <laughs> we do, and they all have ensuite bathrooms for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is very important. So there you go. Exactly, exactly. Uh, they do. So please come anytime, Rebecca. And you can you would love it because you probably would you would be, I'm sure, going around in particular the Tudor part of the house, the library, the drawing room, the great chamber, the West Room, all these other rooms that we haven't discussed, and and the staircase hall. And you would be pointing out things that I would be fascinated to to know more about and, and wouldn't have known. So you must come. I'm inviting you. Here's your official invite. Yay! Yeah, once they let it. us, once us Americans are allowed there. <laughs> I know. I know. Please come soon. We're all missing you. Yes. We yes. We all want to. That's the problem. Especially when somebody says we can't, then we want it know, even more. Are. Exactly. Exactly. We talked briefly about this pandemic, and obviously running such a large estate is not inexpensive. And right now, you know, with closures, I, that affects your bottom line. But recently, you were able to open up the gardens again. Yes. Yeah, which was really exciting. So we've, we've opened up the gardens, um, which is great. But we usually get about 150 to 200 visitors a day. And we're, you know, we're averaging 30 to 40. So you know, even with the gardens being open, I think, you know, people are still very cautious about obviously going out in public. So we, we've had to postpone all of our weddings until next year. Um, 
and the cafe, we are now doing takeaway. So you can eat outside and get a, you can get a sandwich. You can actually get the Earl of Sandwich sandwich, which is roast beef, horseradish, and watercress. Um, and so you can get an Earl of Sandwich sandwich. And then what the government's done over here, which is quite clever, is through the month of August and I'm sure you know this, Rebecca, but the month of August is pretty much everybody in Europe goes on holiday. Um, So the the government wants to try to help restaurants um, and their indoor seating. And so they're doing a a scheme that throughout August, Mondays through Wednesdays, if you eat in a restaurant, even if it's outdoors, it doesn't matter, you get... um, 10 pounds off per person up to a party of four. So you could have an 80 pound bill and you would get 40 pounds off um, that bill and the government pays for it. So the government's really trying to uh, uh, get the the hospitality business, you know, as much as it can back on track by offering these, these different schemes. So we will open up the cafe um, as an even indoor seating uh, August 1st, which is very exciting. Hopefully things will start to pick up. But again, we, you know, it's, it's, we, we would like Americans to come visit us. We would like other European travelers to come visit us. I mean, travel overall, even if our borders are open, is down significantly. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to look at other ways to, and, and we, you know, I, I suspect until people start to feel even more comfortable um, getting out and about, we have to start thinking of clever ways to uh, to keep uh, this house, to be perfectly honest, in mm-hmm. the family and to keep history as you know, to keep history alive, and that's really what it's about. Because it's one thing to go to to come to the UK and go to a, what's called a national trust home, which is, means that it's not lived in anymore. It's been sold to the national trust. And so when you go through the tours of the house, you just have lovely volunteers who are repeating stories that they've heard. But the difference is, is when you go into these homes that are open to the public, but are still privately owned by the families, they tell the most extraordinary stories. Like my in-laws tell the best stories. And those are the best people to tell the stories because they still, they tell these stories with with such enthusiasm because it's about their ancestors. And so I think that's what makes a big difference between coming into a home that's still lived in as opposed to a home that's maybe much more like a museum now is that the homeowners are the ones who can really tell you the story. So we're, we're thinking of clever ways to to bring in more income. One of the things I've done is I've launched a Patreon account and it, and it kind of goes back to what the fourth Earl of Sandwich and Captain Cook had with each other. Um, you know, Captain, uh, uh, the fourth Earl was, uh, in a sense, a patron of Captain Cook. So he, 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 um, made sure that he had money to go on his explorations. And th- my patron account is the exact same way. So we're releasing videos behind the scenes at Mapperton, a whole bunch more. You can get tea towels, mugs, um, a discounted stay at one of the cottages on the estate. And the money through patronage uh, helps the repairs and the restorations at Mapperton. So there's really clever ways that we've been able to come up with digitally to uh, to help keep these repairs and restorations of this historic building. I think that's wonderful. Patreon is such a great resource to have. It's something I use as well, and I I've absolutely love it. I love how it works. I love Wait, it. Okay. What are you on Patreon? Tell me. Yeah, yeah. Mine's oh. just uh, patreoncom slash Dynasty. Oh. Okay, that's what I thought it was. I'm going to go look that up right now. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it's it's honestly, it's the best way to be able to fund anything. And I wouldn't be able to do this show with all the equipment and the software and the research that yeah. goes into it without having that awesome resource there for me by the wonderful listeners, which it yeah. blows my mind. It always it blows my mind that they're willing to donate to me. Yeah, no, I know. Isn't it fantastic? I think it is really fantastic. And I think it's, I think it's a way that it's the way of the future. Now, uh, one of the ways of the future is that especially people who can't come over to see Mapperton, I'm doing videos that, that, you know, that they can see and only they can see. So, um, it, it's a fantastic way. I'm, I'm going to join your, I'm going to, I'm going to go $3 a month right now. 
So oh, that's you're up. so sweet. Yeah, Thank you, Julie. No, of well, course. And, and I want everybody who's listening who can help to make sure to go to what's, what's your Patreon page called? So I'm American Aristocrat. Perfect. Go to that page. I'll include the link in our show notes. I'll include it on all the social media because let's help out Julie. Let's help out Mapperton Estate so that it continue to thrive as it is now because we all love history and we want it to stay that way. That's exactly right. Thank Her- you. And I, I've just, I'm, I'm excited about yours. I'm just boom, click and buy. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you are amazing. Julie, so thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Rebecca, for having me. It was a real treat. And now we come to our new segment of the show called Ask the Expert. Today we have historian and author Heather R. Darcy with us. Heather, thanks for being on today. Hey, thanks for having me. We're going to have you answer some Anne of Cleves questions for the listeners and followers of my social media. So are you ready? I am. I'm excited. Okay, let's start out with Twitter. Let's talk about, um, let's see, her Twitter handle is at girl from Heber. Would like to know, did Anne of Cleves learn to speak English well? Yes, she was, I believe she was fully bilingual or could be considered bilingual right around by right around the time that the annulment happened. And she certainly had a good command of it, as far as I'm aware, for the rest of the time that she lived in England. She kind of had to learn English because she wound up being there the rest of her life. She was kind of forced to in that respect. Yeah, I mean, there's there's two aspects to that. First of all, because she was the Queen of England, even if it was for a short period of time, it was expected of a, a wife or a bride to learn the language of the country where they're living. We saw the same thing with Catherine of Aragon. So she she had to learn it in that way. But then also most of her German servants had been sent or were called back to Germany. So even after the annulment, she still had mostly um, English people to attend to her and they didn't speak German. So she had to continue to develop her English language skills so that she could live her life. Basically the at girl from Hever also wants to know how long exactly did she live at Hever? And do we have any record of anything she said about living there? So I'm, I'm not sure. I have read a little bit about her time at Hever. I don't think there are any firm dates of when she was there. There was a letter, which I think Hever Castle might be in possession of. But at one point, she was talking about the honey that they produced there, and she liked that. So there is evidence that she was present, I believe, but I don't know about any hard dates. And she, her whereabouts aren't very well documented overall after her time as Queen of England. Kathleen from Bloomington, Minnesota, wants to know, how well-educated was Anna? That's a tricky question. If you look at German standards at the time, she was very well-educated as a noblewoman. If you look at English standards, she wasn't. Part of that was because in the, the English tradition, women would learn things like music or they might do a little bit more reading into some of the human and like the humanist literature that was coming about. I know that Anne Boleyn did quite a bit of that. Um, They just kind of had a more broad, almost fanciful by German standards type of education. Whereas a woman like Anna in the German system, she would have learned how to run a household. She would have learned how to cook. And that was something that she indulged in in her time in England as well was cooking. But she would have learned how to cook, how to mend and make clothes, how to embroider, which I know was something that they, that she had in common with her English counterparts and just very, very practical things. So by German standards, Anna was very well educated, but by English standards, she was not. Heather in Arkansas wants to know, do you think, this is always the burning question, do you think Anna married Henry as a virgin and did she have a child from a previous relationship? I would be astounded if she was not a virgin and I would also be astounded if there was any primary source proof that she did have an illegitimate child. And that's for cultural reasons. So in Germany, there was this concept of the Frauenzimmer or the ladies room, which was kind of like a separate court that echoed the male court. But there were basically no men allowed into the court, into the ladies room or the ladies court at any time. Um, Certainly not after dark, unless there was a medical emergency and a physician was asked to attend to a woman. No one who worked, no males that worked or served in the Frauenzimmer were over the age of 12. 
the Fallen Sima by ordinance, by Cleve's ordinance, was actually locked at night. So I don't see how that would be possible. Additionally, whenever noble women were out and about or mingling with male counterparts in the court, there would have been a governess present keeping a very close eye on everything. And I think that it's a really interesting idea to ponder, but I just don't see how it's possible. What I would say is that there were more than there was more than just Anna herself who could have been called Anne of Cleves at that time period. So it wouldn't surprise me if maybe there was some other Anna that whose life overlapped hers. But even then, I think it's it pretty impossible, culturally speaking. And just I've not seen any primary source refer to her having a child out of wedlock. The next question comes from Kristen in Las Vegas, Nevada, and she wants to know the question, or I should say the statement that we hear the most about is how Anne of Cleves was the lucky one. So she wants to know, do you think she would have lost her head had she not agreed to the annulments? Absolutely not. There's no reason to think that. And that's the one thing every year when we talk about the anniversary of Anna's annulment that surprises me the most. She was an important political figure. If Henry lopped off her head for no reason, as a subject of the Holy Roman Emperor that could have started an international incident with Charles V, which Henry wanted to avoid, and I go into that a lot more um, in my book, and of course that's why Henry had to have his marriage annulled, because he was trying to avoid an incident with Charles V, or Anna's brother Wilhelm could have come and used his forces to invade England. It just would have been a mess. So I, I don't understand why people think that Anna escaped with her life or escaped with having her head chopped without having her head chopped off because it doesn't make any sense. Um, I know what happened to Anne Boleyn. Of course, we see what happened to Catherine Howard later on. And technically, both those women violated the law. And I think that would have been very, very difficult to find any kind of legal pretense or thing, legal thing that Anna would have violated that would have led to her having her head chopped off. So, and I know that the stuff with Anne Boleyn with Catherine Howard was sketchy and, and all that. So I'm not trying to say that they were hundred percent guilty of anything. Cause I don't, I don't really think that either, but there was just nothing that Anna would have done that would have put her in that position um, to be executed. So Brian in Peoria, Illinois. Is that right? Peoria? It is Peoria. Yes. I'm. Yes. That's, that's a great state, the state of Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, Brian wants to know, and this one I think might be a difficult one to answer. He wants to know, do you think Henry regretted divorcing Anne? I can't answer that directly because of course there's no smoking gun where Henry's pining away for Anna like there was for one who was pining away for Anne Boleyn. But um, it wouldn't surprise me. He had to divorce or actually annul. I keep saying divorce and that's not the right term at all. He had to have the annulment from Anna because of political reasons, because her brother was acting like a child and trying to start a war with the emperor and have the backing of Henry VIII. And so he couldn't, for the safety of England, remain married to Anna. I think that Anna would have made an excellent queen. She was raised to be the wife of a powerful person. Also, I think that, uh, or one thing that I consider is that during that time period, men thought that it was women who was in charge of the, the sex of a child at birth. And we have to remember that Anna's elder sister, Zabilla had given birth to four sons, four sons, three of whom lived to adulthood. And so Henry probably liked Anna for the, the idea that she had it in her family line to, to, to birth sons rather than daughters. Um, she, but there's no reason to, to think that he didn't like her. And I feel like I'm getting a little rambly, but overall it wouldn't surprise me if he regretted it. Anna did have a chance at remarrying him after the Catherine Howard debacle. But again, there was still this underlying war brewing between her brother and the emperor. So he couldn't. And then Henry finally marries Catherine Parr. I think partially, if we look at the timing to avoid the, the Cleves question when the war between the emperor and Anna's brother started. So I don't, I don't think that, I think he would have had a nice life with Anna and I think he recognized that, but I don't think that I have enough direct evidence to affirmatively say, yeah, I think he regretted not being married to her. So I hope that's a good enough answer. <laughs> That's a really? fair answer. It's fair. <laughs> so. and lastly, I'm going to ask you the question. I think that uh, always comes up in conversation. And I know we discussed this on a previous episode of the podcast, but we've kind of, I've kind of interchanged between Anne and Anna um, as I've been talking and speaking with you. And I also um, want to touch base on her being a duchess. So can you 
quickly go about explaining why you call her Anna and why she's a duchess? Yes. So I call her Anna. We have to keep in mind that I'm kind of more of a Holy Roman Imperial Germany historian than a Tudor historian. So I'm kind of more Tudor adjacent. And her birth name was Anna. So it's like Catherine of Aragon. Her birth name was Catalina. When Catherine of Aragon Gone came to England. She was, I think, about 15 or 16, and she spent the majority of her life in England. Anna came to England when she was 24, or yeah, 24. And so, and she passed away when she was 42, and she spent most of her life as being Anna. And when she wrote her letters home to her brother and her mom in England, she still, or excuse me, in Germany, she still signed as Anna. So she still identified as Anna. So that's part of the reason why you call her Anna. And also, frankly, it's just easier when I'm talking about the six wives to differentiate between Anne, meaning Anne Boleyn, and Anna, meaning Anna of Cleves. So that's why I do it. Um, and then as far as her being a duchess, so she was never a duchess regnant in Cleves, but in the Holy Roman Empire, particularly in the part that is now Germany, there was a status called being a born duchess. And what that means is that if a woman, a born duchess, has no brothers to inherit, then the husband of the born duchess then gains rights to the territory, uh, Jure Oxoris. And we see that with Anna's own mother, Maria of Ulichberg. She had no legitimate brothers. And so when she married Anna's dad, who was the Duke of, or the heir to the uh, Duchy of Cleves Mark, he then became Jure Oxoris, the Duke of Ulichberg. So she wasn't a duchess in the English sense, but she was a born duchess. And in her or excuse me, on her legal paperwork or her contract or whatever you want to call it for when she was entering into this marriage with Henry, she does sign as Anna geboren Herzogin von, von Jülich Kleveberg, which means Anna born Duchess of Jülich Kleveberg. And then there's a few other things that she writes. But so that is a, that is an actual thing in Germany, but it's not something that I that I've ever seen in England. All right, Heather, thank you so much for coming on the show today for our Ask the Expert segment yeah. and, and for answering all of our Anne of Cleves questions. Yeah, and if you want to learn more about her, my book, Anna, Duchess of Cleves, The King's Beloved Sister, is available online. I think there's only a few more hardback copies left, but the paperback is coming out later this year. And my next book, Children of the House of Cleves, which looks more at Anna's siblings in Germany and a little bit at her, but mostly her siblings in Germany, that is due out next year. Wonderful. And your book is amazing. And I'll be sure to include a link so that everybody can go buy it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Heather. And now we've reached the new segment of our show called Tudor Tidbit. Today, I'm going to tell you all about Alice Arden and the murder of her husband. Now, Alice conspired to have her husband, Thomas Arden of Faversham, murdered so that she could carry on a long-term affair with a tailor by the name of Richard Mosby. Now, the murder took place on the 14th of February, 1551, Valentine's Day. Alice was tried, convicted, and burned at the stake for her part in the murder. Now, let's go back a little bit and find out what exactly happened. The main characters in this story are Alice Arden, her husband, Thomas, and Alice's lover, Richard Mosby. Now, here's how they were all described. Thomas Arden was described as a man of tall and comely. Now, Alice was described as a gentlewoman, young, tall, and well-favored of shape and countenance. And her lover, Richard Mosby, is described as a tailor, a black swart man, former servant to the Lord North. Now, all of this was written in the Hollinshed Chronicles. So if you'd like to dive a little bit deeper in it, go ahead and pull those up. They're available online to look up. So apparently there was this known poison maker nearby. I think it was in Faversham, if I remember correctly, that Alice went and approached him. He was actually a painter, um, but she had found out that he was also a poison maker. So she approached this man about it. He quickly denied it. But she must have been rather convincing because he did eventually admit to being able to make the poison for her. So she instructed him then to give her a poison that would kill quickly. Now, the man explained to Alice after giving her the poison that to properly disguise the taste of it, that Alice would need to add milk to the poison, not the other way around. By adding poison to the milk would give it a funny flavor and the victim would figure something out. 
Now, the day that Alice chose to poison her husband was a day that he had already chosen to leave their home and to travel to Canterbury. She prepared his breakfast with a glass of milk, adding the poison to it after. Now, I just explained it's going to give it a funny flavor, right? So after a couple tastes of the milk, Mr. Arden, disliking the taste of it, asked his wife, Mistress Alice, what milk have you given me here? Upset that her plot was foiled, she knocked over his milk and said, I say nothing can please you. Now, after all of this occurred, Mr. Arden still had to go to Canterbury. So he got on his horse and on the way there, he had the most horrible pains in his stomach, which caused him to stop. And he began vomiting. Apparently, she had not been able to get him to drink enough to die. So Alice's mistake in mixing and adding the poison after the milk instead of the other way around, actually saved her husband's life. But that wasn't the only time that she tried to have her husband killed. She and Mosby had many failed attempts before they were obviously caught. Now, the lovers had also hired several conspirators, likely other people who had had grievances with Mr. Arden, to aid in the murder. In one account, Alice paid a Mr. John Green, a business rival to her husband, to hire assassins to murder him. Mr. Green then hired two men, a man who went by Black Will and another who went by Shakebag. Now, Mr. Green made sure that Black Will knew who his victim was and pointed out Mr. Arden to him while they were in London. Apparently, Mr. Arden had a servant with him who was loyal to Mrs. Arden. Now, that servant would be how they gained access to Mr. Arden's lodgings in London in order to murder him. Black Will offered to kill both Arden and his servant, the one who was loyal to Mrs. Arden. Now, Green told him, no, only Arden. Well, evidently, Mr. Green didn't trust Black Will and somehow got Mr. Arden's servant alone and told him that Black Will might try to kill him too. And as expected, the servant was scared for his own safety and made sure the door to the lodging was locked that night. So the plot was once again foiled. Then they tried again when Mr. Arden was on his way home. This time the plan was to ambush and kill him. Arden's servant was once again involved and he pretended that the horse that he was riding was lame, telling his master that he would have to go on without him. But unfortunately, this plan also backfired because Mr. Arden convinced some other people to travel with him. So he was never alone. Now, eventually they were successful in their attempts. And on the 14th of February, the Arden servants were sent away. Now, some have said there was a fair that day, so that would have been a reasonable explanation to let your servants go. Go enjoy the fair. Well, Alice had Black Will hide in a closet in their house in the parlor, and she instructed Black Will to wait for the signal. When Mr. Arden arrived home, he was told that supper wasn't ready. So Mr. Arden and Mr. Mosby decided to play a game of backgammon while waiting to eat. Mr. Arden was seated with his back to the closet, the same closet that Black Will was in. And when the time came, Mosby said, Now I may take you, sir. At that, Black Will burst out of the closet and began to strangle Mr. Arden. Mosby then struck Arden with a heavy pressing iron, which knocked him out. But Black Will finished the job with a dagger. Now Mrs. Arden, wanting to be sure that her husband was dead, also thrust a dagger into her husband's body several times for good measure. Unfortunately for them, their attempt to dispose of Mr. Arden's body in a nearby field was unsuccessful. It was easily discovered. Since Mr. Arden's body showed signs of murder, it really didn't take long before they were arrested and tried for murder. Alice Arden's attempt to be free of a husband she clearly didn't like or love turned into her downfall. While her husband seemed to live with the idea that his wife was having an affair, Alice clearly wanted more. If you're interested in learning more about this case, there is a lot of great information online, as well as a wonderful book called A Biographical Encyclopedia of Early Modern English Women. And that concludes this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. You can find my show notes from this episode and how to become a patron at tutorsdynastypodcast.com. Don't want to miss an episode? Be sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Patreon, Podbean, or anywhere you can find podcasts. Thanks for checking out the Tudors Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at tutorsdynasty.com. 
Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening.